Hi, I'm Tom Zimmerman from the EMDR podcast. This episode is a response to um, Bruce Ecker's video from several years ago in which he comments on, on Flash as a, as a memory reconsolidation approach. And it is, um, it is pretty cool that Bruce Ecker, who developed his own transformational psychotherapy and did a lot of the hard work of translating uh, the memory reconsolidation lab research into language and perspectives that trauma therapists can use and understand, uh, took the time to evaluate and conceptualize a therapy that at the time was largely just this tentative technique. And even in its first articulation was undergoing some pretty substantial uh, transformations. So in some ways, what in watching the, the um, the Bruce Acker video, um, in some ways, I wanted to comment um, on some of the assumptions built into that, but it's a little bit unfair that I'm referencing a several year old video in response to a five year old article um, that was published by Phil Manfield who developed, who developed Flash, um, describing you know, the first implications of this approach um, because what Flash is um, tends to be an ongoing evolution. So again, um, you know, Bruce Ecker's commenting on the very, very first kind of articulation of it. Um, Flash has evolved and evolved and evolved and continues to um, go under pretty, pretty consistent um, evolution. Um, and the reason I'm making this video is to try to clear up some of the misconceptions about flash or flash-like approaches, and some of which are evident in Bruce Acker's video, but I'm doing this even at the risk of introducing more confusion, um, because one of the things people ask me a lot is, you know, Tom, why do you keep using a flash-like approach? And, um, and part of the reason I, I do that is, is I suppose, you know, who has the right or who has the authority in a sense to, to define what Flash is. Um, and I think that's probably Phil Manfield who developed it. So part of what I'm gonna need to do is say, you know, this is where kind of Flash was in the beginning. This is how it was understood. This is where a lot of people are using it now. This is where it's going. So, um, so in a lot of ways, Flash um, and flash-like approaches are among the most confusing of the recent psychotherapies. And there are reasons that account for that confusion, but I'm not really going to go into that now. And um, I can't really speak for anyone but myself. And in a lot of ways, um, in a lot of ways, I'm, I describe myself in reference to Flash as, as Tom from Ohio. I'm, I'm a licensed counselor. I practice in Ohio. But I do want to communicate that there is something um, and there are ways to do flash that produce results that are simply stunning. And, um, and there are ways to do this that will allow you to use and stand on a pretty stunning set of adjectives that are not typically associated with trauma-focused care. Words like safe, reliable, predictable, um, pathways, this pathway, this healing pathway, or what we can learn from flash approaches. Um, we can help people heal who are not embodied. This pathway works in the absence of adaptive information or insight. This pathway works with clients with severe dissociative processes. This pathway works with clients with severe personality um, issues. Um, and these are some of the very populations that even Bruce Acker, and of course many others have commented, can be very difficult to work with um, in the existing trauma psychotherapies that are transformational. So in short, we have some pretty good treatment options for relatively healthy people with extensive traumas. If you have a non-pervasively traumatized nervous system, um, 
we have plenty of options that may work really well for you, but we don't have a lot of options for people with severely and comprehensively traumatized nervous systems that just permeate and affect many, many parts of the self and profoundly affect the way um, the self looks and the way the self is perceived in the world. Uh, so part of, what I, part of what I want to communicate very clearly is that um, flash-like approaches, using information from flash, um, can let you help people heal and let people heal in ways that may be the closest thing that we have to a combination lock to unlock traumatic memories. It is as simple as that, as that high school locker combination, several rounds, to, you know, three rounds to the right, two rounds to the left, right back to that 14, you know, pop. Um, there are ways, um, there are ways to, to mess up that combination lock. Um, but this is a pretty profoundly astonishing, reliable, predictable, safe way to do trauma work with some of um, the most pervasively traumatized nervous systems you're likely to work with. So again, um, I need, I'm going to need to start putting down some anchors because of the way um, Flash, Flash has evolved. Um, and it has changed a lot from its original articulation um, in 2017 in its original article. Um, the way many of us practice it is different than the early versions articulated by Manfield. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be clear about exactly what I mean um, by, by how I do flash-like approaches and use that as a kind of reference point. Um, Bruce Ecker's video... Um, just I kind of will include in the notes below this video um, how to how to reference his video um, is built around many of the many of the assumptions that are in that Manfield article. I'm um, also post the 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 reference for that Manfield article, um, and some of these assumptions are easy enough to dismiss or easy enough to misunderstand in the context of what Flash has become, but. In his trying to make sense of Flash, based on this article, Ecker defines a term um, called absolute lethal status. And what, that, what he means by that is that there may be information stored in packets of implicit information other than the actual memory. Um, they may reflect pieces of learning um, related to just, just the wisdom or the safety of interacting with memories like this. And of course, it's not particularly controversial that such types of learning may exist, right? So if, if we have a traumatic memory and every time we've interacted with that traumatic memory, a catastrophe has ensued, it may make sense that there will be other chunks of implicit information that may stand between, you know, between consciousness and that original piece of implicit information that may just be, ah, uh -uh, we're not going there, can't tolerate that. Um, and that does make sense from a parts perspective. <laughs> you know, we, we know how um, parts can be very, very, very protective of trauma and, and lots of different psychotherapies. So what is, what Ecker is proposing is that what a lot of flash does is neutralize the memories associated with the assigning of the lethal, lethal status. So the memories that, that we have encoded related to the safety and wisdom of interacting with that original memory, it neutralizes those pieces of implicit information, but largely leaves the actual traumatic memory alone. Okay. Um, so part of what he's claiming is that, okay, so we're, we're removing the memories or we're transforming the memories or the learning associated with lethal status, but we're not really transforming that, that original memory. He also proposes another possibility. And there's another possibility that, you know, well, if that original memory does clear as a result of this, it may be that that original memory didn't really have that much heat in it to begin with. So. 
in thinking about this, I mean, I'm a little bit confused about why a nervous system would go through all the trouble of building this information, you know, these other chunks of implicit information about the lethality of this memory, if this memory itself is pretty innocuous. So my sense is that, the, that it is the memories that are at, actually do have an enormous amount of volatility that were most likely to have networks of protective responses associated with them. But I guess that's not my point. It's just a point of, it's a point of confusion in, in my sense of conceptualization. And there may be a much simpler answer, right? There may be a much simpler answer. Um, my larger point is that actually targeting these memories using flash-like approaches does transform the memory that we're targeting and also transforms the associated learnings, right? The associated, the, the chunks of implicit information that may need to clear in order for us to access that memory to begin with. So, um, so my sense is that, you know, we just kind of move the camera a little bit. Um, Bruce Ecker is saying that, that we may only be working here. And I'm saying is that when we work here, we also clear out the protective responses. It's a little bit also unclear from Ecker's conceptualization why Flash would work on one category of implicit information, you know, the packets that, that store the lethal status, but might not also work pretty well on others, i.e. the original memory itself. And again, this may be a little bit of an unfair criticism of, of Ecker because Phil Manfield's original description really does describe this as, as the therapy that we're gonna use to target only the most severe, severe of the traumas in, in the most severe, severely traumatized nervous systems. And that's really how I would describe it, right? And, and again, in Manfield's original version is we're gonna take only as, we're gonna take as much heat out of this as we can. And then we're gonna use EMDR or we're gonna use some other transformational psychotherapy to pick up wherever flash may leave off. But since that article, uh, many of us use flash approaches and as does Phil Manfield, right? It, it's changing. Um, many of us use flash approaches to fully and adaptively reprocess all across the SUD scale. So Ecker's argument that this is approach that we use only in the most severely, most untouchable memories, flash-like approaches work absolutely beautiful with the beginning SUDs of three or four or six. Um, they work and with the same ease that any other transformational psychotherapy would work at a SUDS of three, four, or six. So there is no reason other than the original art articulation in the article why Flash only needs to work on the most existentially or the most untouchable um, of, the, of the memories. Also something that those of us who do these approaches see very, very clearly that I'm not sure Manfield did five years ago, and I'm not sure Ecker can see in reference to, to the Manfield article. There is the assumption that Flash does not touch cognitions. Um, and that, and, but what I'm arguing is that Flash therapists who work with clients and who know how to do flash well and do practice flash well and comprehensively and work with the memory until the distress is a zero, um, we don't see shifts in cognition largely because we don't ask about them. There's not a flash protocol in which we actually ask, has that trans, uh, has that belief about yourself moved in any way since the distress is, um, zero. And because of this, because this, because this approach was originally conceived as a gateway to EMDR, and EMDR we're going to assess for memory, for, um, for the movement of cognitions. Um, most people don't ask if that memory has been transformed, but I'm going to get back to that in just a minute. 
So part of what has limited us related to flash is the agendas that we have brought to it. So if you view a hammer as a tool largely to hang a frame, right? If you have a hammer, you have this tool and you view it as a, as primarily and, and almost conceptually as something that you're gonna to use to hang a frame, it can do that. It can do that really well. Given a little bit of time, given a little bit of other information, um, it can just simply take a little bit of time to see how in a different set of hands, this is something that can build a house, can help you build a house, or it can help you dismantle a house. So, and I guess in a lot of early approaches, they are limited by the perspectives and the agendas that are brought to them. Um, and that's been one of Flash's biggest problems conceptually is how it has been kind of almost <laughs> confusingly plugged into other psychotherapies. And, um, and those of us who, who approach it as a kind of independent approach to healing um, can see this for really the remarkable tool that it is. And those of us that do see it as a remarkable tool of healing, when you ask about cognitions associated with those memories, you're gonna find that when the clients with flash process a memory down to a zero, um, every metric that we would consider that memory resolved using EMDR or any other transformative psychotherapy is going to be met meaning the sub is gonna be a zero. Every part of the self is gonna know that that memory is over. That memory is gonna function like something like an old memory. It's gonna function as though you were able to make sense of it at the time that it happened. You're gonna be able to visit that memory whenever you want and it won't cause a catastrophe in the body. So what I'm saying clearly and explicitly is that flash approaches do this. Is it a different pathway? Absolutely. Are there virtues in going on a journey using different ways? Absolutely. A journey on an airplane is a completely different journey than a journey in a car. And a car journey is completely different than a journey walking. So I'm not saying, I am not saying that flash approaches are going to generate the same meanings and associations that would come if you went on the journey in a different way. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that Flash will get you there. If you need to go from Cleveland to San Francisco, Flash will get you there. It is a way to make this journey. And, and if it's, if this, what I'm saying is a little, I mean, it is important because what I'm saying is that Flash-like approaches practiced well transform, um, transform, for instance, cognitions, right? Transforms cognitions. And why does it do that, right? It's not because there's something unique in Flash or there's something unique in EMDR or there's something unique in coherence therapy, right? What I'm saying is that when a memory resolves, when a memory fully and adaptively resolves, what that means when we make a hot traumatic memory a normal, normal memory, what that means is that the associated beliefs about the self and the world change. What that means is that all of the pieces that are in that chunk of implicit information um, also resolve, right? So flash approaches practiced well, simply transform all aspects of the memory, including sense of time, reactivity, meaning, safety, agency, awareness that all part, awareness of all parts that the experience is over, right? Appropriate attribution of responsibility. All of these things happen in psychotherapies that are um, transformative. So in a lot of ways, we don't, you know, we don't want to say, you know, this therapy, you know, this therapy transforms not, doesn't just take the heat out, but actually transforms um, the way we think about ourselves in the world. Every psychotherapy that is transformative um, transforms every part of that implicit information. And if in the early versions of Flash, 
we only looked at it as a way to cool down hot memories, then that was reasonable to assume at the time. Um, it just, we would just assume, okay, well, this is a tool. This is not a complete psychotherapy. It is also possible that the reason these memories cooled but did not fully resolve is that early flash practitioners weren't really doing this in the most optimal way. And we've learned um, better, more effective ways to do this. So in some ways, if flash was conceived to save the marriage of EMDR and the, the most pervasively traumatized clients, if, that, if that's the kind of original conceptualization, flash right here um, is maturing. It's growing up. It's developing a voice of its own. And if we listen to it, we listen to what it has to say, it can teach us a lot about how we heal, how we might heal. So flash as a pathway of healing in the human brain can teach us a lot about healing. So my goal is to show how looking at healing from multiple perspectives, let's look at healing from, from an EMDR perspective, let's look at healing from a flash perspective, let's hook, look at healing from an internal family systems perspective. Um, what that's gonna do is let us see, you know, all of these approaches to, you know, to, to healing traumatic memories that are transformative, allow us to view healing from a different perspective. So um, let me really quickly put some anchors down um, related to what I mean by flash approaches the way I do it. And again, I don't really have the power to define anything other than how I do it <laughs> with my most pervasively traumatized clients. Um, so if we're tapping into a pathway that might allow us to easily quickly and deeply heal. Nobody owns that. Right? I'm going to say that again. If this is a way that our brains know how to heal, nobody owns that, right? That is our kind of common heritage. That is our common birthright, how we heal. And Lord knows we have spent an enormous amount of time trying to heal on incredibly effective channels and in incredibly effective ways. And if this is a way, if this is a way that people can fully and adaptively heal, then we should say that clearly and independently. And we should teach people how to do this um, clearly and independently as a birthright, as a function of being human. So the point I want to say in putting down my anchors is that Flash is one of the most explicit memory reconsolidation approaches Although where Phil Manfield seems to be taking this tends to kind of uproot it, you know, the idea of subliminal activation tends to be up unanchoring it, I would say, from, from memory reconsolidation. And what I want to do is very, very briefly describe what memory reconsolidation is. Um, so, but before I do that, I want to describe what, it, what, what we're transforming. So if we think about a chunk of implicit a implicitly, almost a packet of implicitly stored information. There may be in that packet the raw sensory information of that memory, the bad memory, the raw sensory information. There's also schema, right? There's, there's information, there's beliefs, there's shortcuts to survival. There's, and that, those shortcuts are not ambiguous. Those shortcuts are not safe, don't trust, run. You know, they are, they are not nuanced, saturated. They are beliefs about the self and the world. They're beliefs that kind of provide a shortcut for survival. And, um, and also in that chunk of implicit information is a snapshot of the self, it's a snapshot of the world at the time that trauma happened. Okay, so that's what we're transforming. And what memory reconsolidation has shown us this lab research and, and how we can um, work with transforming this implicit information into more normal memories um, in, a, in a very, very limited amount of time. Um, it, it works this way. We, we activate the memory. 
right? And we encourage the client to have an experience that is disconfirming of the schema, of the, of the beliefs that are in that memory, okay? And again, Flash does this explicitly, and I'm going to talk about exactly how Flash does this explicitly. But before that, I want to talk a little bit about what Flash-like approaches have at the point where I'm putting the anchors down, what Flash-like approaches have that are common to other psychotherapies, okay, that are transformative. So in other psychotherapies that are transformative, there's activation to some degree, okay? There's noticing to some degree, meaning you are directed to put your focus on something. And, um, and what that is varies across those different psychotherapies. There are also shifts of focus, right? And shifts of focus are just a really, really common point, uh, a common element in many psychotherapies that are effective, right? So this, this shift of focus, activation, activating, and encouraging the client to notice and experience, this is a shift of focus. Activate, notice, activate, notice, activate, experience. In EMDR, activate, notice that activation in your body. In flash, activate here, push it out of awareness, load it, notice the calm scene. So these shifts in focus are really, really important. The version of flash that I'm referencing includes very, very light activation. It is an explicit activation. We are referencing a very specific memory and we're lightly activating it. We do not want to snap the mousetrap of the amygdala but we do want to activate that memory enough to bring it into working memory. And then we're going to immediately pivot away from it, right? So we're not going to notice. So in EMDR, this is what activation looks like. Activation and noticing are part of the same piece. What we're noticing is what we've activated, right? In flash approaches, it's really different. What we're noticing is not what we've activated. We're gonna bring this into awareness. We're gonna push it out of awareness. And this is this calm scene is what we're gonna notice, okay? And then while we're in this calm scene, we're going to disrupt our ability to remain in this calm scene. So one of the really active ingredients in EMDR is we're gonna bring up this, we're gonna have this calm scene, which does this confirm the negative cognitions that are in that memory, but we're gonna disrupt our ability to stay in that calm scene. And the way we do that with flash-like approaches typically is by blinking, right? So if we're focused on this calm scene or it's calm process or what Manfield calls a positive engaging focus, but yet we're disrupting our ability to be in that calm scene or to stay focused on that calm scene by a motor activity. And that motor activity is blinking, which for a moment causes us to shift focus and be present. Okay, and then we repeat this, right? We lightly activate, calm scene, go in and out of that calm scene. Right? Lack, lightly activate, calm scene, go in and out of that calm scene. Um, so what Flash can teach us, right? What Flash can teach us, not just about healing, but about healing from a memory reconsolidation perspective. What Flash can teach us is that these elements are super, super helpful light activation is enough. You do not have to completely set that memory on fire. Light activation is enough to bring it into awareness and to bring it into consciousness. It also teaches us that noticing, right, that important aspect in trauma therapy, that important aspect in, in really all, all psychotherapies built around mindfulness, that, no, that noticing does not have to be linked with activation. Noticing and activation can become detangled. And as a matter of fact, in flashlight approaches, when they don't work, it's almost always because these are intersecting and that, and that this is happening, right? Instead of lightly activate, push out of awareness, notice the calm scene, okay? So, um, also, what seems to be really, really important in flash-like approaches are these explicit shifts in focus between the calm scene and the present, okay? So again, what information is there that may be very, very helpful 
not just for trauma therapies or developing new trauma therapies, but maybe related to memory reconsolidation itself. Remember how I said in memory reconsolidation, we activate the memory and we encourage the client to have an experience and to sit with that experience, okay? If you do this, activate disconfirming experience. If you do this, that memory is very, very likely to resolve in time in an adaptive way. What is astonishing about flash is the speed at which it resolves. It resolves very, very fast. And part of the reason that it resolves is because we are going in and out of this calm scene. And one of the things that may teach us about memory reconsolidation is it may not be important to be in that calm scene for a long period of time. If we want healing to happen faster, okay? So think about classic kind of memory reconsolidation. We activate the memory, we encourage an experience. And we're doing this in flash-like approaches. We're doing this every 30 seconds, okay? But while we're doing it, what we're doing is this, right? Calm scene, what we're doing is this. So instead of going into and sitting in the calm scene once, what we're doing is we're going in and out of the calm scene. What that may mean is that shorter and more frequent exposures, maybe it's the going into the calm scene, the going into, because when we're in the present, we have to be in the present, we go right back into the calm scene. Present to do the blinks, calm scene. So instead of these long periods where we're in the calm scene, we're in the calm scene a few seconds at a time, and that may be enough. So what we're doing is instead of long, slow exposure to the disconfirming information, we're, we're blink, blink, black back into the calm scene. We're blip, 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 blip. So in, for instance, in EMDR, where we do our noticing, right? We may go in and out of that noticing, you know, 30 times, 40 times in, in an EMDR session. Now, in flash, we may go in and out of activation 30 or 40 times. But you know what we're doing? We're going in and out of the calm scene hundreds and hundreds of times, right? So my suggestion is that there may be information there that the disconfirming information, if pre presented in very short, discrete chunks, um, may help a client transform a memory much, much faster than these, than these longer, um, slower, um, slower, slower approaches. So many of us are doing flash-like approaches and see clients reliably, predictably, and easily process memories all across the distress scale. Many of us are doing flash-like approaches with clients that we simply can't do yet with, with other, other, more intensive, uh, other more intensive approaches. And these clients, these clients who cannot right now do these more intensive approaches are doing this hard work and they're doing it in flash in a relatively non-intensive way. And do you know what they're doing? I promise you. What they are doing piece by piece is they are rescuing themselves from the past. Um, and when they do that, when you, when you resolve a memory, regardless of how you resolve it, it does become some adaptive information about yourself in the world. Um, Flash-like approaches, and this will sound a little bit controversial for those of you who are used to more intensive approaches. Flash-like approaches are safe enough to have clients practice on their own as a kind of first aid to manage the ongoing seeping of trauma. They just are. Um, many of us do a few sessions with a client, show clients how to do this on their own between sessions. And now the clients who have been trying all of their lives to make sense of trauma have a pathway that is very, very likely to be effective um, in, transforming, in transforming memories on their own between sessions. 
And if that, if you just assume, even if you don't believe the premise of it, think about how, how remarkable that would be in healing ourselves in the 21st century as a species. So again, there's something that Flash can teach us about light activation, focusing on a compelling scene and going in and out of that scene and then repeating the process. It's easy. It's relatively safe. It's reliable. And we can assume that this has been a way that humans have had the capacity to heal for as long as we've had this brain. So why aren't we showing as many people as possible how to do this? And if you're not convinced, if you're not convinced, if you think of Flash as a product of magic or misdirection, or if it sounds too woo-woo, or if it's the work largely of charlatans, I'd like you to, I'd like to show you, I'd like to try to show you its simplicity. <laughs> I'd like to show you its simplicity. I'd like to show you how we can use flash-like approaches to turn almost any resource, right? This calm scene, which is at the center of it. You can turn almost any resource into a psychotherapy that can reliably, predictably, and safely transform any wounding experience into adaptive information about the self and the world. That is incredibly good news, right? Now, to sum everything up, to sum everything up, I'm hoping, I would love, I would love to be able to show you, right, how doing this work in this way and my version is at four blinks, F-O-U-R-B-L-I-N-K-S dot com. It's just my version of how I do um, these, these approaches with really severely traumatized, traumatized clients. There are other versions. There are other scripts that, that can do the same thing. So um, I would, I'm trying um, to say that there are ways to do this despite the changes despite the agendas that we brought to these approaches, there are ways to do this that can teach us an enormous amount about how systems heal, about how, how our nervous systems heal. They are incredibly easy to teach. They're incredibly easy to do once you get it. This therapy is very, very easy to do. I would love eventually for people who are trained in trauma-focused care to do this work in parts of the world where there, where there just aren't people with a master's degree for hundreds of miles. Um, this is a remarkable pathway of healing. It can also serve as a bridge to everything else you do, right? Because if you do work currently in a psychotherapy that you really love, that is transformative, um, in working with some of the most severe clients, you're going to have a pretty long preparation phase before you're going to be able to, before you're going to be able to get them on that pathway or to get them to tolerate the distress of what may come up on that pathway. And you know what you can do while you're preparing them? Um, you can do these approaches and you can do these approaches very, very soon. And your client um, will be able to go on this more intensive journey faster. Why? Because you are treating the presenting issue sooner. You're, pres you're treating the infection in their system sooner. You just are. So um, again, thanks a lot. Um, uh, let me know if I can be helpful in any way. I am super excited about this work. Thank you for all that you do um, in the world. Thank you for all that you do. Um, to help end suffering. Thank you.